Hello again, welcome back to IndyCar on the 22nd of June. Now yesterday I think I warned that, um, this being the silly season for the news, that the, um, the desperate measures being taken by the British press to try and either prevent the Scottish independence referendum from happening or to try and discredit the SNP Green government a bit more or in some other way to attack Scotland that all of these attempts were going to get more and more ludicrous as time went on. Well, my predictions came true this morning. What do I see when I open the BBC's webpage but a ridiculous piece of statistical nonsense? Apparently, Scotland is now um, the leading place in the UK to drown. Yep, apparently it's much more likely that you will drown in Scotland than any place else in the, in the UK at the moment. Drownings apparently are up. Uh, despite a Scottish government plan to try to reduce the accidental deaths of people in Scotland's waterways. Now, you might think, well, OK, there's been an increase in the statistics for people drowning, but that's probably due to the fact that people have just come back out of hibernation after being in, um, in COVID lockdown twice, and they're now visiting Scotland's tourist attractions, and we have a lot of water, probably more water than any part of the United Kingdom. So you would expect the statistics for drowning in Scotland to be higher than any place else anyway, just simply because there's more of the stuff to drown in in the first place. But this headline gives the impression that, you know, if you visit Scotland, you're likely to drown. And that's not really true. I mean, you'd have to actually get yourself onto a bit of water in the first place, not wearing a life jacket and doing something stupid, like maybe going for a dip in some very freezing cold water in the loch, or going out in a boat without your life jacket. Now, you can't stop people doing stupid things. And as, as I said, there's more water per head of population in Scotland than virtually anywhere else, probably in Europe, never mind the United Kingdom. So the statistics is just nonsensical. But I was trying to take a swing at the Scottish government because they have been trying to cut the number of accidental drownings in Scotland but to no avail. Probably, as I've said, because far more people are taken to the water after lockdown and of course we've got more of it and therefore statistically it's much more likely that the statistics will be higher here. But not happy with trying to trash our record on drownings, they then posted a, a very interesting story about a 100 year old gentleman in Edinburgh who still works two or three days a week. Now, when you see these headlines together, it begins to look like you're, you're likely to visit Scotland and die of drowning, and the, the local pensioners have to work right up until they're 100. This gives a very misleading picture of Scotland. The fact that one single 100-year-old chooses to work a few days a week, and it's entirely up to him if he's fit enough to do it, why not? But it's just all of this misleading nonsense. Of course, this is the silly season. This summer period when, well, traditionally, uh, Westminster and Holyrood go into recess, so there's no stupid stuff being done by the politicians that we can talk about. Well, there is, but nothing official. So they have to talk about something else. And so we have drownings and 100 year old workers. But it goes on and on. But I've also been watching the news from England and particularly the way that the uh, Tory government is handling this rail strike. Here in Scotland, the, um, the dispute at the moment is still kind of log jammed. Basically, the Scottish government, which is now the employer as far as uh, the railways in Scotland are concerned, with the Scottish government taking uh, ScotRail back into public ownership, means that they get to negotiate with railway workers, but not, incidentally, those who work for rail track, the people who maintain the rails and the sleepers and all the bits and pieces which actually the trains run over. That is still the, the, well, basically it's the duty of the British government to deal with that, but they don't seem to be doing a terribly good job. Grant Sharps, who incidentally was revealed uh, recently to have been using false names to promote a Ponzi scheme online where he was basically selling a self-help book to people and then telling them to recruit a hundred other people to buy this self-help book um, and used three different false names to do it. Grant Sharps, this is the man who is supposed to be uh, helping, if that's the right word, or facilitating the British rail companies. Now remember, the, the railway system in England is privatised. And the privatised firms have been wanting to lay off over 3,000 railway workers 
reduce the safety of the railway um, by reducing the number of people working on the tracks and maintaining the lines, as well as cutting the wages of thousands of rail workers. And they're surprised that they go on strike. But not content with that, Grant Shapps has also been lying about the unions, claiming that the union had walked out of talks when they plainly hadn't. Grant Shapps is well known for lying, and his, um, his history in the past uh, for trying to set up what is basically an online con with three different names has been well published in many other places. But this is the guy who is supposed to be in charge of the government's response to this crisis. And he's got to the point where he's recommending that agency staff be brought in to, to run the railways. And uh, even particularly Sky News uh, and others have been claiming that um, the rail strike is going to cause people to die because they can't get a train into hospital. Now, anybody who is at the brink of death doesn't go to hospital in a train for a start. They go in an ambulance. So all of this nonsense, having a go at the, the unions, is just typical Tory far-right policy. The wealthy owners of the railway companies, the shareholders of private companies are getting wealthier and wealthier, while every single private and public sector worker in the United Kingdom gets poorer. And for once, the unions are doing something about it, and I believe there is going to be a summer of mass strikes all over the UK, mostly down to the Tories' mismanagement of the economy. In Scotland, the rail dispute is still uh, in negotiation. The negotiations have stalled, but nobody has walked out. You don't see the Scottish government lying about the unions walking out of talks when they haven't. Yes, these are hard negotiations and there will need to be some trade-offs and there will be some horse trading and compromises. That is the nature of any uh, workplace dispute resolution. It has to be resolved by both sides. I don't hear anything about the Scottish Government doing the kind of nonsense which Grant Shapps is up to. Now, the final thing, the final interesting piece of ridiculous nonsense from particularly the BBC today was uh, a piece they were talking about, Nicola Sturgeon, as about to, to make clear how the new referendum is going to be staged in Scotland with or without the so-called permission or the Section 30 order from the United Kingdom. And the BBC helpfully suggested that in order to avoid a court challenge from uh, the British government, that the Scottish government should rephrase the question. Uh, so instead of asking the public whether Scotland should be an independent country or not, they should, and this is, I'm paraphrasing here, they should ask a question which says, should the Scottish government negotiate Scotland's independence with Westminster. Now, if you think about this for a moment, that sounds terribly helpful because that's going to avoid this legal challenge. But in actual fact, it does two things which go against independence. The first one is that instead of the British government having to respond to the democratic will of the people of Scotland in a referendum, in other words, if we vote yes, they have to do something about it, or they look pretty stupid, They've moved the goalposts, or are trying to, through the BBC, so that it's the SNP who has to get the independence from the UK by entering negotiations with Westminster. Now, the other downside of this, if you think about it just for a nanosecond, is that if the referendum question was that, and the people of Scotland said, yes, we want the SNP to negotiate independence with Westminster, then Westminster would have the opportunity to negotiate so that Scotland takes a good chunk of British debt, because that's what the negotiation would be about. It would be about assets and liabilities. The United Kingdom would want Scotland to take a huge burden of their debt. £180 billion pounds worth of British debt would be dumped on Scotland in exchange for our share, our 10% or so, of all British assets. And frankly, I don't think they're worth that. So the BBC is very helpful when it comes to making independence more difficult by putting the responsibility for gaining independence on the SNP, when in actual fact it's not the SNP who would be gaining the independence. It would be the people of Scotland demanding it and the British state having to give it, because that's what this is about. It's not to do with the SNP negotiating independence, it's to do with the Scottish people saying that they're demanding their independence. I suppose you could change the question to something along the lines of, uh, 
should Scotland end its union with England? And because that basically is the same thing. Ending the union with England would return all powers to the Scottish Parliament and the union would be over. But that's not going to happen, I don't believe. As far as I understand it, the SNP is sticking with the original question, which is perfectly fine. And it's definitive. Do you want to be independent or not? Yes or no? It's pretty simple and it's very definitive. There is no ambiguity in it. And no party is responsible, particularly in Scotland, for what happens afterwards. Because it's the British government. In fact, I should go a bit further and say it's the English government which has to respond to that democratic demand by the majority of Scots. And they cannot ignore it because once a democratic event of this type has taken place, and if there is a yes vote, then the British government ignores that at their peril because if they ignore it, then Britain is not a democracy anymore. It becomes a dictatorship. And if it becomes a dictatorship, then Scotland could probably just say, well, bye-bye, we never signed up for this. You said you were a democracy, you plainly aren't. You're ignoring our demand for independence, which was democratically gained, using a system which you approved, a referendum which you used to gain your independence from the European Union. So if it's good enough for you to leave that union, it's good enough for us to leave this one. And that is really where it all hangs. I think the um, the media is doing an absolute bang-up job of looking absolutely stupid in the, in the last few days, coming up with the most ridiculous stories. I mean, come to Scotland and you're more likely to drown. And if you're a pensioner in Scotland, you're likely to work till you're 100. I mean, this is the impression these headlines give, and they know this. The other one I noticed today is that an avian flu on St Kilda is going to wipe out... Uh, all of one particular species of birds, as if avian flu is entirely the fault of Scotland and that it's the only place where avian flu exists, far from the case. So, <laughs> you were in the silly season, right enough, and until Nicola Sturgeon actually tells us how they are going to have a perfectly lawful referendum, and remember there's a difference between illegality and unlawfulness, a referendum can never be illegal, simply because it is by its definition, it has to be lawful. It has to be legislated for under the laws of Scotland. We already have a Referendums Act, which enables any referendum of any type to be held. And that means that a second piece of legislation, known as the Scottish Independence Referendum Bill, then needs to be discussed needs to be passed as an act, and that enables the lawful referendum to take place under the laws of the country where it's being held, i.e. here, under Scottish law. There is nothing in English law which can be done to prevent it. If the British government decided to try to challenge this in court, even if it were the Supreme Court, which meets in England, a, it would have to contain a particular number of Scottish judges, for a start, and it would have to use Scots law only to make its challenge. And that would be a relatively simple case to dismiss that, because when the Act to enable the Scottish Independence Referendum to take place has been passed in Parliament, it has been debated, it has been legally examined, it has been found to be perfectly lawful, and it is almost impossible for the UK to do anything about that. They might try to hold it up, but they would fail, because even if they got some kind of court action through the Supreme Court to try and stop it, you can't really stop a democratic event. That would be like the Scottish government taking court action to stop the Brexit referendum from happening in England. You can't do it. We couldn't do it with Brexit. The English government cannot do it with the Scottish exit vote because it's our vote. They're not involved in it. They're not being asked to vote in it. Um, we give them the political nicety of inviting them to participate and inviting them to recognise uh, the final result when it comes in. If they choose not to do that, then basically they're absolving themselves uh, of any care whether Scotland becomes independent or not. And quite frankly, I don't think the people of England are that bothered whether Scotland leaves the UK or not because they're convinced that Scotland is a burden. Whereas we know that it is Scotland which has been providing all of the cash money which the United Kingdom has been using to keep itself afloat since we discovered oil in the North Sea. 
So there we have it. Okay, the BBC is doing its usual thing of trying to paint Scotland as a dangerous place, somewhere where you could easily drown accidentally in the piece of water, or some place where if you get to your hundreds you'd be expected to work. Not a lot of nonsense. The whole thing, absolute rubbish. I mean, I cannot think of anything more silly than the statistics that the BBC put out today. Anything to try and discredit Scotland. The rail unions uh, in Scotland, I think, will come to an agreement with the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government knows it wants to get the trains running again, and they will have to make sure that public sector workers in the rail industry, who are their responsibility, that's those who run the trains, are paid properly, and that safety standards aren't compromised, and that these workers get the kind of pay rise that they need to survive the massively rising prices. We've now heard that uh, inflation has gone past 9%, heading towards 10%. It's 9.1% at the moment, a record, uh, which hasn't been set for 40 years, apparently, and is on its way, I think, eventually it'll get up to about 15%. And we'll see an almost exact copy of what happened in 1972, when the whole country went on strike because prices rose so high that nobody could afford anything. And they'll tell you that it's all the fault of the Ukrainian war, which of course it isn't. It's to do with the way the British government has been running the country. And anyway, that's about it, I suppose, today. But um, honestly, if you look at the BBC's website on any particular day during the summer, it's always good for a laugh. Because frankly, their attempts to try and make Scotland look unattractive, dangerous, uh, or just plain old mean, uh, just fall on deaf ears. None of it makes any sense. When you actually read down through the story, you think, well, this isn't really a story. You know, one guy, he works a couple of days a week. That wouldn't be a story anywhere, even in a local newspaper. People drowning on a loch happens every day, any place where there are lochs, canals, waterways, rivers, the sea. I'm pretty sure there are plenty of drownings in England as well. It's just that most of them will happen in the sea because they don't have as many locks. And there you go, that's about it really. But let's wait and see what Nicola has to say next week. There are a lot of uh, BBC media hacks who are absolutely frothing at the moment over the fact that they don't know how this is going to be legal. They can't see how it's going to work. And these little helpful suggestions about how we could change the question, which would allow the British government to stiff us with huge amounts of debt, they're not going to, to work on us. We can see through them. It only takes a minute or two for you to think about the effects of changing the question to what the BBC suggested, and you realise that that would put all the responsibility on the SNP Green government to provide independence and would allow the British state, as I've said, to stiff us with a gigantic bill for the debt that they ran up, not even particularly on our behalf, although they claim it is. Anyway, that's about it for me today. Just remember the facts. Scotland has a right to vote on its own future. We have the finding documents to prove that. We are allowed to depose any rulers we don't like. We can kick any monarch out that we don't like. We can also completely boot out any government that we don't like and install a government which best suits our needs. And in this case, in the independence referendum, we're going to be asked if we want that government to sit here rather than in London. It's quite a simple prospect. It's not complicated to understand it. And there is no legal challenge that I can see that would make the slightest bit of difference to this, despite people like... Um, Ooh, what's his name on the BBC? Old Glenn. Yes, old Glenn there. I had to go at him the other day. But anyway, that's it for me today. Enjoy your day. The sunshine is coming out. It's nice and dry. It looks set fair for the next few days. So get out and enjoy the weather. And remember, Nicola Sturgeon was not going to come up with a referendum that's illegal. I mean, who would do that? I mean, what would be the point? So we'll have our referendum. It might be interesting, actually, to see how early it is. All we've heard from Angus Robertson is that it will be before uh, October next year. And that's an interesting way of putting it. It will be before October. So it could be any time next year. And I hope uh, Glenn Campbell is listening to this because it could be any time, Glenn. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye for now.